In early August 1993, in the town of Sabona, Stephen County, New York, a terrible case occurred that shocked the entire country. A teenager identified as Eric Smith was accused of brutally murdering a four-year-old boy. Smith was 13 years old at the time of his arrest, which caused a stir both in the media and in public debate about the mental health of minors in the United States. The application of appropriate sentences, the capacity of the penal system juvenile and the doubts surrounding rehabilitation and reintegration programs for young people who commit crimes of this magnitude. Around noon on Monday, August 2nd, 1993, the disappearance of a four-year-old boy named Dirk G.R.Y. alerted the entire community of Sabona, a quiet small town in New York with just over 1,000 inhabitants. Dirk's mother, Doreen Rye, told police that that morning her son was eager to attend a summer camp located less than 100 meters from her home. Even though the woman never let him go anywhere alone, Due to the boy's insistence and the nearby camp, he finally agreed. Dirk said goodbye to his mother at the door and walked towards the park, which was less than a block away. A few minutes later, around 11 in the morning, the sky became cloudy and it began to rain. Doran quickly headed to the camp to look for her son, but was horribly surprised when she was informed that Dirk never arrived at the scene. The search for the boy began immediately, with the participation of local police officers and residents of the area, searching nearby streets and forests in search of clues. Although the town of Sabona was extremely quiet, investigators did not rule out the possibility of a kidnapping. After just over four hours of searching, a group of volunteers found the little boy's lifeless body near a forest about two blocks from his house. The scene was heartbreaking. The killer had crushed his head with at least two rocks that were still at the scene, one of them weighing almost 12 kilograms. In addition, they had pulled down his pants and inserted a small wooden stick into his rectum. Forensic doctors confirmed that the cause of Dirk Rye's death was a blow to the head, but they also found strangulation marks on the body's neck. This news not only devastated the boy's family, but also the officers involved in the case and the entire community. Given that crime rates in Sabona were practically zero, the murder of a four-year-old child was outrageous and terrifying. Many residents believed the killer was a stranger passing through town and feared for the safety of their own children. Investigators assumed that the killer would have intercepted Dirk near the camp and tricked him into following him into the forest, where he eventually murdered him. Although some experts recognized elements of a crime of a sexual nature, such as sodomization of the body, some clues found at the scene were puzzling and contradictory. On the day of his disappearance, Dirk was carrying a lunchbox with food prepared by his mother, which was found at the crime scene. The killer opened the lunchbox, stomped a banana on the floor, and stuffed a sandwich into the victim's mouth after he died. Additionally, he poured a soda called Kool-Aid on the victim's wounds and took off her sneakers, leaving them near her hands. Although investigators detained and questioned several suspects, they did not have enough clues to solve the case. At that time, the entire community tried to collaborate with the authorities to identify and capture the murderer. Some neighbors pointed out different suspects. However, only one 13-year-old boy named Eric Smith claimed to have seen Dirk shortly before his disappearance. Eric voluntarily showed up at the police station three days after the crime to offer his help. According to Eric, he saw Dirk walking towards summer camp, wearing a white t-shirt with the Looney Tunes character known as the Tasmanian Devil and holding a lunchbox in one of his hands. The location indicated by Eric was close to where the body was found, and the victim's description completely matched. Investigators paid attention to his testimony but when they asked more complicated questions, Eric became irritated and went so far as to ask if they were implying that he had killed Dirk. Eric's stepfather, Ted Smith, who was accompanying him to the police station, offered him a glass of cool aid soda to calm him down, but Eric violently threw him to the ground. This caught the attention of the agents who were interviewing Eric, as Dirk's body had been bathed in the same soda. Eric's strange behavior aroused suspicion among the agents, who were sure he was hiding something, 
Officer John Hibbs, one of those in charge of the case, said in an interview years later that at first investigators believed that Eric had witnessed something that morning, but possibly he was so traumatized that he was not able to remember. The hypothesis was even raised that he had witnessed the murder and that the person responsible had frightened him so that he would not speak. Although he seemed to get nervous at times, most of the time he enjoyed the limelight he was getting. However, officers assumed it was simply because the boy was enthusiastic about assisting in a police investigation. The next day, Friday, August 6th, Eric, accompanied by a couple of detectives and a cameraman, got on his bicycle and pointed out the place where he claimed to have seen Dirk Rowey a few hours before he was murdered. However, his testimony did not entirely coincide with his initial statement. Smith not only described the victim's appearance, but also talked about a small lunchbox that the boy was carrying in his hand and that was indeed found at the crime scene. The problem was that the distance at which he claimed to have seen Dirk was such that it was impossible for him to have noticed the details of the lunchbox. For investigators, it was clear that Eric was lying and that he was much closer to the victim that morning, but they thought that perhaps he did not want to admit it for fear of being framed for the crime. Dirk Rowey's funeral took place on Saturday, August 7th, which shocked the entire community. The helplessness of the community strongly demanded that the authorities resolve the case and arrest the murderer. Part of the ceremony was broadcast on television, which caused a huge stir nationwide. Dirk was a child of only four years old who had been brutally murdered, and as long as the person responsible was free, all the miners in the area were in danger. At the same time, Eric Smith's contradictory confessions had investigators and his own family in suspense. On Monday, August 9th, after being questioned by his parents and grandparents, Eric Smith tearfully admitted having murdered Dirk Rowey. The revelation took the Smith family by surprise, because although they suspected that the boy might know something about the crime, they never imagined that he was directly responsible. After finding out what happened, they immediately went to the police. Eric's arrest quickly caught the attention of all the American media, causing an enormous stir at the national level. Just 13 years old, he had become one of the most infamous murderers in the country. Eric Matthew Smith was born on January 22, 1980 in Stewen County, New York, and was raised in a middle-class family consisting of his biological mother, Tammy Smith, his stepfather, Ted Smith, and two sisters. From a very young age, Eric demonstrated a difficult personality. He was extremely restless, impulsive, and suffered from uncontrollable tantrums. However, his real problems began when he entered school. He suffered from a language and learning disorder that prevented him from functioning correctly in the academic field. He obtained low grades and had to take an extra year before entering first grade. In fourth grade, he was failed for not doing his homework for a period of seven months and showed no interest in improving. In fact, Eric hated going to school and was constantly bullied by his classmates, who made fun of him for his physical appearance and the way he spoke. All this began to frustrate him and awakened in him an enormous thirst for revenge. Although he was prone to angry outbursts for no specific reason, his targets were other, much younger children. The boy was extremely angry on Monday, August 2nd, 1993, as he had been expelled from summer camp for his bad behavior. As he was riding his bike back home, he saw little Dirk Rowey walking down the street. He approached him and tricked him into accompanying him to a wooded area, where he strangled him to death and then repeatedly threw a 12 Kaylee rock at his head. At first, Eric was unable to explain why he murdered the victim and why he was so cruel to her. Shortly afterward, he said that at that moment, he felt an uncontrollable urge to hurt someone and that he simply could not control himself. In addition to having the miner's confession, investigators found small drops of blood in the Smith family's bathroom, which corresponded to that of Dirk Rowey. Eric Smith underwent various psychological and psychiatric examinations. And although specialists discovered that, in addition to having speech and learning problems, he had a relatively low IQ, this did not represent an impediment to facing a judicial process since he was fully aware of his actions. 
The trial began on August 2nd, 1994, amid great media excitement. Defense psychiatrist Dr. Stephen Herman stated that the minor suffered from intermittent explosive disorder, a mental condition that causes violent, disproportionate, unpredictable, and uncontrollable behavior. It was proven that Eric's mother consumed a drug called tritium during pregnancy, medicine intended to control epileptic seizures, but which can cause irreparable damage to the fetus, according to Stephen Herman. The intermittent explosive disorder and the curious deformation of her ears actually reflected a mental illness caused by the effects of tritium during pregnancy. This, added to the constant harassment by his schoolmates, turned Eric Smith into a violent young man unable to contain himself. In turn, the miner's stepfather, Ted Smith, explained to the court that on one occasion he saw Eric extremely upset and asked him what was wrong. The boy was shaking and asked for help because he felt angry about something he couldn't explain. The man told him that when he was young and upset, he used to hit a punching bag until he was exhausted and that it calmed him down. Eric went out to the patio of the house and minutes later returned with his knuckles skinned and bloody after punching the trunk of a tree several times. During the trial, it was not only proven that Eric's stepfather, Ted Smith, beat him with a belt when the boy misbehaved, but he also sexually abused one of his stepdaughters, sparking a new scandal. The defense attorney, Kevin Bradley, acknowledged before the judge that Eric Smith had committed a terrible crime but assured that he was mentally ill with various extenuating circumstances and therefore not impeachable. On the other hand, the prosecution alleged that the accused was fully aware of what he had done, that he planned the crime, and that he even enjoyed it. The cruelty towards the corpse demonstrated a sadistic personality driven by resentment and sexual aggression. By inserting a piece of wood into the victim's rectum, it was a warning that this type of behavior could be repeated in the future. Perhaps what caught the most attention during the process was the imperturbability of Eric Smith. He did not seem to show any emotion. He did not apologize to the parents of the boy he murdered, nor did he express remorse. Finally, on August 16, 1994, he would be found guilty of second-degree murder and sentenced to a minimum of nine years to life in prison the maximum sentence for juvenile criminals. The controversial case produced countless discussions about the responsibility of the parents, both of the victim and the perpetrator. Some sectors questioned the fact that Eric's mother, Doran, let him go alone to summer camp, considering that the minor was only four years old. The woman stated in an interview that at that time she was going through a very difficult situation because her youngest son, Dalton, would not stop crying. However, she clearly regretted not accompanying him. Additionally, Eric did not appear to have received any guidance or help regarding his sudden mood swings and episodes of uncontrollable anger. He lived in a home where his father not only abused him physically and psychologically, but also sexually abused one of his sisters. After spending several years locked up in a juvenile facility, Eric Smith was transferred to the Clinton Correctional Facility, a maximum security prison, in 2001. While incarcerated, he wrote a letter in which he publicly expressed remorse for the first time. In the letter, he stated that he knew his actions had caused a terrible loss to the family, and that he was very sorry. He had tried to think of everything Dirk would never experience, like turning 16, celebrating Christmas, owning his own house, graduating, going to college, getting married, or having his first child. If she could go back in time, she would trade places with Dirk and endure all the pain he had caused her if it meant he would live on. Eric Smith applied for parole 10 times from 2002 to early 2020, but all of his requests were rejected. Despite demonstrating good behavior in prison and expressing regret on several occasions, he specialized as a carpenter and electrician studied religion, and met a lawyer with whom he became engaged in 2019. It was not until February 1, 2022 that he was finally arrested. He was granted parole after spending 28 years behind bars. For more than two decades, Dirk's parents, Dale and Doran Rye, tried to keep Eric from getting out of prison by repeatedly bringing the case to court. After Smith's release, they were very disappointed 
and have demanded several reforms to the United States parole law. On May 14, 2022, the Sabona community dedicated the Dirk Rye Memorial Field, a field where a memorial statue is erected. Dirk was a baseball fan and was buried in his uniform after being murdered in August 1993. The murder is considered a serious crime due to the irreversibility of the damage caused, the suffering of the victim's family, and the social impact. In many countries, those responsible may receive several years in prison as punishment and may even be sentenced to death. Forgiving a convicted murderer is something very complex and not only involves the victim's families and the entities of each country, but also society in general. This will depend on several factors such as cultural values, personal beliefs, and the circumstances of the crime. When the murderer is a minor, the situation becomes even more complicated as it involves legal and criminal considerations, child development factors, treatment and rehabilitation, among many other considerations. Well, I hope you enjoyed the video. Leave me your opinion in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and activate the notification bell so you don't miss our next videos.